started. Good evening, everybody. Hello, everyone. Okay, happy Friday night here at Peters Valley. Here is the time that we host instructor presentations. Our visiting instructors are going to give 10 minute talks about their work and themselves. And to keep the event rolling, we do not take questions. If you have any questions for our instructors, I do encourage you to you know, find them afterwards or talk to them while you're here taking your workshop. You've got all week. Um, and before we get started, I have a couple final words. If you don't mind, bear with me. I just like, just because it is our final Friday night of instructor presentations of 2023, it's kind of a big deal here. Um, it's very sweet to say out loud. Our season is not over, but it does certainly feel like we are closing a chapter with this being our last, you know, five day session. It's, we've been doing these long week long classes since June. It has been an amazing, you know, buggy, hot, wet season, but it's been an amazing journey. Um, there are many moving parts to making workshops happen here, and when I look around our campus, I can't help but think of how it takes a village to run Peters Valley, and I'd like to thank some of those villagers here this evening. First off, I'd like to thank our education director, Abby Mechanic, for putting together for putting together a wonderful lineup of classes. The summer's instructors have been knowledgeable and incredibly talented. Abby, you play an important and vital role to PV and you always handle it with such grace and positivity. It is something to be admired. Now to Allison, Allison von Baron, our facilities director, thank you for all your words of wisdom that just come throughout the day and for taking care of Peters Valley's campus. It's a big job, and you deserve at least 10 clones of yourself to assist you here. And until that day comes, I applaud you for all of you work, the work you do here. Now, to our essential, sensational studio crew. That's David, Anna, Elizabeth, Lindsay, Wyatt, Timber, Andrew, Persis, Ryder, Cam, Lara, and Katie Beth. Thank you for all you do to make the workshops at Peters Valley happen. They couldn't without you. You are all the heart of the workshops here, making sure instructors have what they need for class, that your studio is ready for each week, for being a helping hand to our students and instructors during the classes, for driving instructors and students around campus, for operating open studio hours late into the night after a long day, and for all the things you do that I don't see, thank you. And I truly hope you've enjoyed your summer here working alongside fellows press people every week. Now, specifically to instructor presentations, I do want to give a shout out to our assistants and Lindsay and Elizabeth who don't have assistants. Thank you for introducing your instructors. Your introductions have been genuine and without a doubt speak from the heart. So also thank you everybody for helping me take all this down at the end of the evening. It's such a sigh of relief when I turn around and it's just all put away in the bin. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And lastly, and also very importantly, I do want to thank our instructors and students for wanting to come to Peters Valley, because truly that's, if it weren't for you all, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. So thank you. And that's all I had to say. So I just wanted to say, you know, thank you. It's been a great summer. <laughs> We are going to start off with our first instructor in wood shop. There's two of them this week. We're going to start with Robert Lyon, and to introduce Robert is the assistant Lara Mochales Mate. Robert Lyon is a distinguished professor emeritus from the University of South Carolina. For 38 years, he taught ceramics, glass blowing, and sculpture at LSU and USC. He has been the recipient of many awards and grants. In 2014, he was awarded an Individual Artist Fellowship in Craft from the South Carolina Arts Commission. And in the present, he has his own studio and works in sculpture and woodworking. Welcome, Bob. Great, thank you. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, I started teaching at LSU in 1978. And so this is going to be just a few images to give you an idea of where I've been and how I've gotten to where I am today. So uh, 
at LSU is very close to New Orleans and Mardi Gras, but Baton Rouge is not to be outdone. This is the Precision Lawn Chair Brigade in the Mardi Gras Parade. And so one of the things that I would do and my colleague in ceramics, uh, Joe Bova, is we would go out to West Texas and go into the Davis Mountains and camp around Big Bend. And uh, one of the things that I would see are these dry riverbeds with lots of cracking. So I started thinking about how can I replicate that? So I built these wire forms, these big uh, hardware cloth forms. These are three feet square that are then covered in terracotta and fired in the kills. And so everything starts happening, the wire anneals, the um, clay um, cracks, and much like what I was seeing in these uh, dried riverbeds, but they were a booger to move because they were so fragile. And so I started thinking about how can I change this? So I started mixing clay with Elmer's glue and applying it over wooden substructures, literally gluing the clay onto the wood. And so this is 12 feet tall by about 20, feet, 20 inches square. And it's studded with nails, nailed on a one inch grid pattern. And then each nail head is painted and you see some red thread that runs from nail to nail. And so that sets up these different color relationships uh, that show up uh, better than in these images. Uh, this is a project I made at Art Park in Lewiston, New York. And so this is 24 feet long by about six and a half feet wide called Dog Trot. And this is a local clay that we dug up at Art Park and then stabilized with Portland cement. So I was hired. Uh, and so this is a, uh, another piece uh, called Firehouse. And this is uh, studded with matches. And sort of funny, this was sold to the Pan American Insurance Company in New Orleans. <laughs> And their underwriters said they couldn't keep it because it's too flammable. <laughs> so about two weeks after they purchased it, I had to uh, trade them out uh, for something less flammable. <laughs> so I was hired to build a, a glass studio and start teaching glass blowing there. And um, I was invited to be in this glass show before we had glass. And so I decided to make these four cylinders. These are made out of scotch tape. And it's just wound on top of each other. I mean, you know, like 50, 75 rolls of scotch tape and they have scotch tape bottoms. So the insides are sticky, you know, from the scotch tape and they stand about two feet tall and a little over about maybe 14 inches in diameter. And so after one semester, we, um, this is our glass tip blowing studio that we uh, opened up and this was opening night. So this is where I work now, uh, my studio in Columbia, South Carolina. And um, just give you a little quick tour of the place. This is my lathe. And so I have 110 inches between centers. So I can make uh, things that are fairly large. And uh, so this is a piece that really started me incorporating pencils into these wooden forms and this started at the International Turning Exchange. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about this as we get going. So right at the beginning, oh, you can see here, this is a little detail. You can see the glue oozing right up through the pores of the wood of those pencils. And uh, so this is, I'm turning a bowling ball here. I wanted to make a, uh, it's a left-handed bowling ball. So I wanted to make a left-handed cup out of it. So I uh, hollowed it and turned an integral foot onto the bottom and um, finished the inside there. This is a, a piece that uh, Jerome Blanc, he's a, a wood turner in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, that he and I uh, did a collaboration. We were both uh, residents at the International Turning Exchange in Philadelphia. And so this is a piece that he and I made. So, um, at this time, my mom had gotten really sick and she started experiencing dementia. And so I wanted to try to find some sort of um, a metaphor for this loss of memory. And I thought about graphite as may, maybe being something that I could do that with because graphite can be smudged or erased or put down kind of firmly. And so that's what really led me to using these pencils. And so these are stuck into the side of the wood 
and uh, with a conical shaped uh, drill bit so that uh, then I would cut down halfway through the pencils with the turning tools and uh, in order to uh, reveal these half pencil shapes. So I was at a oops, I was at a conference, oops, I was at a conference, uh, it's, it's just flipping around. Um, and uh, someone said, aren't we all vessels of information? So what I did is I started gluing together pages of books and people started collecting books for me. And I had like hundreds of books, old books. And I started gluing all these pages together. And then it, it took months until I figured out that I could use make a dryer as this old chest freezer that I held at 150 degrees with a 100 watt light bulb in it. And then it only took a couple of months to dry these things out because they just put together with uh, type on glue. But this is the first thing that I made. And so this is called uh, information vessel number one. And it is uh, turned book pages that have been laminated together. But so, you know, book pages were wood once and now they're paper and now they're being treated like um, books again. So I've been a beekeeper. Um, I currently don't have bees, I'm sorry, but um, excellent. And so, uh, you know, these uh, these uh, creatures start really um, giving me a few ideas. These are just some of the workers. And um, honey, of course, is one of the great things. And I started realizing that all these cells are six-sided um, objects, just like pencils were. <laughs> so I started drilling into the sides of my pieces, epoxy them in with uh, epoxy uh, colored with graphite powder. And this is what they look like when they finish. And so these pencils that you see embedded in the sides of this piece I call interiors, they've been split sideways instead of on the end. And you can see the pencil, the erasers, as well as the ferrules have been cut in half as I would turn those. So I'm turning pencils, I might as well turn erasers. And so I started gluing erasers together. And this is, uh, they turn a lot like wood. You get you know, these great shavings from erasers. And so here's a little plate of uh, eraser vessels. And so these also have embedded pencils that stands almost three feet in height. And so this is a piece that I finished uh, in 2020, actually for a, a sculpture walk in Columbia. And this is uh, in the uh, Mill District of Columbia. So I wanted to make something that was a tribute to all the people who labored there for uh, so many decades. And so these are just a few um, pieces that were made around 2022 into very early this year. And so I've been turning cork as well and making my own push pins. And so I drill out the lead and glue in pins. So now I have, uh, you know, these are like push pins that fit right into this cork vessel. And these are the most recent things that I've been making. This I call convergence. Uh, yeah, I'll be done. And this stands at about 23, 25 inches in height. And that brings me to the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Okay, our next um, instructor is the other wood instructor we have teaching, co-teaching with Robert is Douglas Finkel. So come on up, Lara. Hello again. Uh, Doug earned his associate's degree from Bucks County Community College. And then um, 
his master's in RIT, yeah, master's science for teachers in woodworking in the School of American Crafts. He has over 10 years of experience teaching at the Virginia Commonwealth University in the crafts department and over 15 years of woodworking, teaching woodworking at a middle school, at middle school and high schools. He works primarily as a teacher and we can all agree that he's really good at that from our experience today. Uh, and he loves to restore vintage woodworking tools. So if anyone wants to buy some tools, visit us, visit us in the wood shop because he has some really cool hand saws. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. Very nice. Hi, everyone. Doug Finkel. Um, I live in Keene, New Hampshire. I'm originally from New York, uh, Long Island. So between these two pictures, I'm about 27 on the picture on the left. That's when I discovered woodworking. And um, as Lauda mentioned, a lot of teaching um, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University, a middle school woodworking teacher for about 15 years, also high school uh, for another few years. And um, a long involvement, Bob mentioned the International Attorney Exchange. I had close to a 20 year involvement with them as a resident artist. Uh, I was a shop facilitator initially, and then I was on the selection committee for many years. And so that kind of brings me, and then between, I also made a lot of stuff. This is early work. I started primarily as a furniture maker at Bucks County Community College. I learned mostly furniture. The work is fairly simple, just paying attention to form and line, um, look, look, looking for graceful forms, uh, nothing too complicated. Some of this is even student work. This is a little bit later work. Um, but again, keeping it simple, trying to pay attention to form, finding grace in the work. Um, I made this piece in 1999, and I'm not very good at the business end of being an artist. I'm not very good at the promotion. Or um, This bench had a life of its own. It took off by itself. I made this then. I went into a show at the Appalachian Craft Center. It wound up finding its way into a number of books, magazines, and a number of museum collections, including this Renwick Gallery, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. And even within the Renwick Gallery, it got selected to be included in the Loose Foundation Center's uh, permanent display collection, um, which is essentially visible storage. But the work is on permanent, it is, and it's, it's on permanent display there. So anyone can go see it anytime. So I'm very proud of this piece. It was a bit of a career changer for me. I made about 42 of these benches over time. The bottom two left ones are collaborations that happened through the International Attorney Exchange. And I still, you know, a whole variety of wood treatments and such. These are three-legged footstools. The fidget spinner footstool was just in an exhibition here at Peter's Valley. Um, and through the, the ITE, I discovered wood turning and my work changed a lot. I started making smaller objects that were just um, these fun, playful things uh, that came off the lathe. And um, this is moving from furniture into turning um, was a sort of a transition for me had fun with that. And then that sort of moved into additional just carving and shaping and um, sort of similar to what we're doing in the class this week. This is the funerary urn that I made for my mother. Um, that's my mother on the right. She was a yoga instructor for over 40 years. And so I modeled this urn um, from Red Oak on uh, that photograph with my mom. There's a copper plate on the bottom. It's hollowed on the left. Green woodworking, again, a lot of what we did today. Um, well, you start doing green woodworking, you really start to know the material even more. And I was well into woodworking for many years before I started doing green wood and learned so much again about the material. And then toward the end of my teaching time as a full-time teacher down in Maryland, um, I saw someone make some Native American style flutes. These are the dual chamber flutes, like the one on the upper left. And that put me in a whole new direction. It's a rabbit hole down which I'm still very deep. Um, and there's two rabbit holes I'll share with you. Um, and from that, I, I was challenged to make some transverse flutes. And I got really interested in flute making. And I, this is from a woodworking point of view, not so much from a mu musician point of view. And um, there's a lot of technical challenges in this, but I was really drawn to the simplicity of a flute, just this idea of a, a tube with holes, just a plug tube with holes. And it's a great example of things that are very simple that have become very, very complex when you try to do them well. Um, so I 
went to England and I took a flute making class. At this was very similar to what we're doing here, a one week long class in uh, at a, the Cambridge uh, Woodwind Makers School. It was a wonderful experience. There were only two of us in the class. So the picture on the left with two instructors. That was nice. And one of the things I came away with was I walked into that shop and it was not a wood shop. It was a machinist shop. It was everything was metal lathes and milling machines. And that was eye opening for me. And I took to it. I really loved it. Um, that's the flute I made on the bottom. Not a great photo, but um, still the best flute I've made. So I went home and I bought myself a metal lathe and I started learning about machining and working in metal lathes. And one of the things that makes a decent quality flute that I learned is that the bore, the hole through the length of the flute, tapers. On a decent quality flute, it gets smaller towards the foot of the flute. So you have to fill this hole that's quite long and it has to be tapered. Well, there's another sub rabbit hole that I went down and I was determined to make tapered uh, bores in my flutes. And so I bought the metal lathe and the first project I did was I made my own reamers. And that's what you see on the bottom right. So I turned this um, 18 inch long reamer on my lathe. It was a good introduction for me to learn about using the metal lathe. A friend of mine with a 1901 horizontal milling machine helped me mill out that little quarter round to create the cutting edge. And I'm very proud of those reamers on the bottom right. And they work beautifully, you kind of sharpen like you would a card scraper. And uh, so I'm still problem solving my flutes, but um, this rabbit hole now I've climbed out of and I'm on to making additional flutes. So I'm pretty excited about that. Well, wow, man, that was my surprise on the next one. <laughs> so about 10 years ago, I learned, and I've always had an interest in vintage tools. I've always been interested in restoring vintage tools. You see the little nub? Is that, did I get an arrow on here? Oh yeah, see the little, the little, oh, the little dot, the little on the bottom slide, it's called the nub or the nib, and nobody knows what they're for. But one thing I learned about 10 years ago was that they stopped including the nib just about the start of the First World War. So if you find a saw with a nib, it's going to be old. And that, that was very exciting to me. And I was interested in old vintage saws. So I found this saw in, in England, and I bought it. And I was very excited. And little did I know I was becoming a saw collector. Um, because once you start, it gets very difficult to stop. And when you do this, you know you have a real problem. And we're all lucky to have a very understanding wife when you come home with it. These are over 180 saws. I went to an estate sale. And the guy said, what are you doing picking out saws? You either buy them all or you go home. And I really like this guy. He was great. So I bought them all. And um, that's the basement of my shop in New Hampshire. And you can see my, my basement shop in New Hampshire. And you can see I did build tills to start sorting through these. I can't tell you how much fun I had and how much I learned going through this pile of saws. Um, absolute. I learned a lot about the history of um, industry in the United States and England, as well as what it takes to, to store a saw. The saws on the left are all from that pile. The top one, can you see there's a little blue medallion on there? That's how I knew this pile was worth buying because oh that I knew that was a I knew that saw. I knew it was a new saw. The ones on the right, that's just madness. That's just when you know you become a collector because I just found these really interesting, the sort of deco one in the middle. I really love Jetsons. Um, the plastic handle on the bottom, which was actually fairly rare. These are from the 1960s. These are not super old. Top one on the right is actually a combination saw. You can lay out angles with those. And there's so when you have saws like this, you need a way to maintain them and sharpen them. So this is my um, 1959 Foley Model 200 saw filer that I was very excited that I got working. And let's see if we can. Here we go. I was thrilled when I got this thing working. That little plectrum that that moves the saw forward just the right amount. And um, you can re if you don't get this right, you can really mess up a saw really quickly. Which not that that ever happened. Yes, yeah, so I messed up a few, but I've learned a lot. I'm still finessing this machine, but it's it's really been a lot of fun. Um, the saw exploration has been great. And I just end with these pictures of myself teaching in various places because I have taught everywhere from little children to adults um, all over the place, and. Um, I love it. And I conclude this because for me, in my career, it's really been about the teaching. Woodworking, especially with children, has been the vehicle. And uh, I thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doug.
Okay. Next up in the blacksmith shop, Peters Valley's artist fellow Anna Koplick is teaching. So to introduce Anna is our assistant, Andrew Wilton. Hi everyone. For those of you who have taken a blacksmithing class here, um, for you, Anna needs no introduction. And those of you who have been here for a couple of years know how lucky Peters Valley is to have her changes that she's brought in our shop in the last three years. For those of you who don't know Anna, Anna is equally comfortable as a teacher, as a studio head, and as an artist. Um, she's just as much at home creating transformative educational experiences, climbing inside a broken machine and making it run again, and um, making just some beautiful works of art, some of which we're about to see. So everybody, please welcome my friend and mentor, Anna Koplik. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I'll try not to let you down. Uh, cool. Hi, I'm Anna. Um, like Andrew said, I have been the artist fellow here for three years, um, teaching hammer making right now, and uh, all of my students are really sore. So it's great. Um, so my presentation is going to be kind of just like what my life is, and also a little bit of art in there as well. So I am a dream and blacksmith. Um, and what that means for me is I travel around, I work for other people, I jump from craft school to craft school, I make architectural work, I make tools, I make utensils, I make whatever people give me money to make, um, and then I live where I can figure out I can live, and it's really fun. So, got a couple pictures here of what my life looks like now, me here making whatever I have time to make in the shop or me working at someone else's shop making hundreds of pickets. So how did I get here? So those of you who've already seen this presentation, this isn't exciting anymore, but everyone else. <laughs> Thank you. So this is me when I was little. Um, I have an older brother, so I got all the hand-me-down weapons um, and armor, which is great. Uh, I think I liked that stuff more than he did. Um, so yeah, I've always like the fun combination of all the sharp stabby things along with all the pretty dresses and flowers and lots and lots of glitter. Uh, so basically nothing has changed. Um, I went to Pratt Institute for my BFA in jewelry. And while I was there, I got super obsessed with blades. Well, I should say I was already obsessed with blades. I just had an outlet for it finally. Um, so while I was at school, I was learning all the jewelry stuff and making these sort of weaponry-ish pieces. And then I got interested in blacksmithing through the metal shop at school. And then I was able to come take some bladesmithing classes at Peters Valley while I was still a student at Pratt. And that introduced me to what that whole world looked like. So I went back and I did my thesis, which is those two, two, two pieces on the right were part of my thesis when I was at school, which was all about wearable weaponry. Uh, so that was sort of, the first and last time I actually thought about a lot of concept. So after I graduated, I was an assistant at Peters Valley. Uh, there's little baby Anna back in the, I don't wanna say the end of the awkward phase, just one part of the awkward phase. Um, and while I was an assistant here, I made a whole lot of sharp stabby things and choppy things. Um, I made my first sword and my last sword that I was proud of. Um, it no longer has a point, but that's okay. It's somewhere in a stump. Um, but while I was an assistant here, I also learned about all of the rest of what blacksmithing has to offer. All of the tools, the utensils, also sculpture, which I am not great at. Um, and I kind of started to move away from bladesmithing and fall in love with all of these other parts of what blacksmithing has. So after my assistantship here, I ended up out at Touchstone Center for Craft, another craft school, which is out in Pennsylvania, where I worked for two years running their blacksmith shop. Uh, while I was there, I broke my hand, so I didn't do as much forging, but I had a lot of fun and learned a lot. I was working a lot on functional objects, a lot of utensils while I was there. And then I also, in the winter between my two seasons, had my first like architectural blacksmithing apprenticeship where I started to learn what that actually looked like. So 
that uh, piece on the right was one of my first sort of architectural pieces I made with my boss that I had gotten to like design and work on on my own. After I finished up the touchstone, um, I kind of started my more journeyman style work. I worked at my first like big kid architectural blacksmith shop out on Long Island, uh, where I was the blacksmith making all of the forged parts in sometimes hundreds of feet of railing. So a day on the job could be, okay, make a hundred of that scroll. And then you just have a pile of that scroll, uh, which I find really fun and satisfying. You get into like a really nice rhythm. Um, and I was also learning how to take all of these forged parts and put them into railings, do all of the welding, all of the grinding. Uh, I was also starting to get into the installation of architectural work, which I find really exciting because you get to spend sometimes months on a piece in your shop with everyone, and then you go and get to see it be in real life where it's supposed to be. So like this here is a pergola that I did pretty much all the layout on to make all the bits fit together. And then I did all of the forged work on those scroll panels on the ends as well. Uh, and then you know the rest of the crew, because it's not a solo operation, helped make all the rest of it and we all installed it all together on one of the hottest days possible and I think I got heat stroke. <laughs> that was really fun and really satisfying at the end. So doing these jobs get to work in really cool sometimes very bougie places um, and get to work on really large scale pieces and a whole crew of people. Um, it's really awesome to be part of like okay I'm going to make all of this one thing and then you're going to go and you're going to weld all of that together at the end we're going to hope it fits on that million dollar staircase <laughs> so after working at that one specific shop and kind of building my skills up i did a little more traveling around i did some different residencies and internships these pictures are from when i was an intern at center for metal arts uh, which is a blacksmith school also in pennsylvania while I was there, I got to be part of them restoring their first um, really large air hammer, um, steam hammer, sorry, now run off of air. Um, so that hammer that I'm working on and with a crew of people, that one is their 3,000 pound uh, hammer. And for context, your average power hammer is like one to 200 pounds. And that's like the weight of the ram that just comes up and down. So that was kind of like a once in a lifetime experience. Um, and it's really not that loud in case anyone was wondering, it's kind of gentle because um, there's just as much mass below the ground as there is above, which is super exciting. So I was doing other residencies as well. I went and did residency back at Touchstone where I got kind of in a little deep dive with tool making, made a lot of tongs and hammers. I'm gonna run out of time, aren't I? Yeah. Um, while I was at CMA, I got to also really deep dive into a lot more tool making, uh, both going into production tool making. So I was like, okay, make like 10 of this thing because the school needs it and getting into repeating processes and then also making just like aesthetically pleasing tools and not just about the function. Uh, I also started kind of making my own aesthetic of utensils, which I hadn't really been doing before. I was getting into this like really delicate, refined aesthetic, um, I guess probably coming from my jewelry background. And so I was taking just like random scrap bits of metal as my like starting point and forging those out and pulling things as far as I could really get them. So this spoon's like about that big. I like making the little guys. Um, and I was just playing around with the idea of like tools and taking the design and forging of tools into my own pieces. So like this little coat rack that was inspired by the forging that I played around with trying to replicate scissor handles. Right when COVID started, I happened to have packed up my entire life and driven down to Texas with no plans past the weekend. Um, so luckily I found a job um, that also had a trailer in the backyard that I could live in. Uh, so I ended up for the first year of COVID working out of this shop in the middle of a uh, cow pasture in Texas, where we had a shower 
that was just like out in the middle of the field that was just like a hose on a stick and a pallet um and it was the best um a big bronze architectural job um we did a bunch of scroll work had a whole team one minute to get through a weird amount of slides here we go and I made a bunch of cool railings. <laughs> so there's some detail shots of this one that I kind of worked on solo. And while I was there, I also had nothing to do after work. So we just made a lot of tools. We'd work for 10 hours and then you live at a blacksmith shop. So you make tools. So I made a lot of tongs, made a lot of hammers and top tools while I was there. My students will recognize the platter that I was using in my demo today. It used to look much cleaner. And we also had sometimes too much fun. <laughs> so from there, I ended up at Peter's Valley, the shop we all know and love. I've done a bunch of shop improvement projects since being here. The tables hold an Anna, so that's good. Um, a lot of fun community building, a lot of fun friend time, rivers, river time as well. Um, and I've still been playing around with utensils, so tiny spoons that are like that big, my little baby spoons, um, kind of getting more into my own aesthetic in utensils, which is still something that I'm refining and kind of, I don't think there's an, an end point, but still playing with. So still that kind of in between blacksmithing and jewelry obsessiveness, and then some production stuff as well. And then over the winter, I travel and do all that architectural work, making a bunch of chandeliers at the shop in Chicago with my best friend, Mac. Um, sometimes just making hundreds of feet of textured metal, which uh, like I said, it's very satisfying. And every once in a while I get to make tongs for my job, which is always really good. And there's some, a lot of teaching and demoing over the winter. I try and find whatever jobs can happen. And a lot of times I get to go cool places. Um, this is what it looks like when I travel over the winter. I live with Triton, my best friend, my truck. Um, and we go wherever we can. And this part of the slide is where you just get to see the things I'm excited about. So there's me at White Sands. There's me at the Grand Canyon. There's me at Death Valley. There's me at Golden Gate Bridge. There's me and Sean and the former assistant here at Joshua Tree. And then here's the family. So thank you. Thank you, Anna. Okay. Next up in Greek studio, right over yonder, we have the collage deep dive workshop happening. And that's being taught by Rebecca Bertoli. And to introduce Rebecca is our 2D photo special topics fellow, Lindsay Davis. I don't know if y'all are like me and get very kind of pissed when you're looking at really good art. <laughs> you're just like, oh, this is just messed up. And usually I use worse language than that, especially when I'm in the office with Abby, just bitching about all the amazing instructors and luckily I get to live with Anna one of them so I'm thankful for that but this week in Greek we have one that also makes me feel that way absolutely enraged by their amazing work Rebecca and uh, I just want to shout out the students as well there's been some amazing uh, conversations happening that's just reminding me of why I'm here and why we're all here so Please welcome Rebecca. Thank you. I don't want to get wrapped up. Um, Faderly. It's okay. Uh, so I am Rebecca Faderly. I'm from Chicago. I make collages. I know. You think of safety scissors and you think of glue sticks and glossy mags and it's a bummer because that's not what collages are. I make collages like this. So this piece has, you know, well over 200 individual little bits within it. And it's about yay big. 
I began making collages in 2009, right out of high school. I skipped the last week of school to get a job as a studio assistant for a collage artist in Chicago. Uh, I won't name names. Um, I had never considered the medium before. I had done it in elementary school, perhaps, and that's about it. He really opened my eyes to the possibilities within the medium, though. We make very different work, though. Um, I realized how powerful of a medium it could be and how special it is in that, like so many of these craft uh, media, you really have to let the material be the material. There's only so far that you can push it. You can work as hard as you can to manipulate it, to turn it into things that it's not, but ultimately it's still that material. So this is an angled shot of that. Let me see if I can, of her from above to give you a sense of the texture of the pieces, of the layering that goes on. Um, my fa This is my favorite way to work, these enormous grayscale pieces. Um, and then these also enormous, I mean, when I say enormous, I mean like, <laughs> like they're very little, um, but I like, I want people to constantly be surprised when they live with these objects. They'll, they'll walk past it, you know, a hundred times and then they'll be like, oh, shucks, I didn't cut. I never noticed that before. Recently, I've been trying to pair down a little bit because those pieces take months and months and my eyesight is getting worse, like markedly worse. And I'm too young for that to be happening, I think. But here we are. So this piece, when I was like, oh, I'm going to pair down, the teardrops are a 16th of an inch wide. So I didn't, I didn't pair down, in fact. <laughs> um, and again, like, I've never seen these this large, and this is very exciting. So here are some more examples of these kind of more pared down pieces. This is what I consider sort of more like if the others are epic poetry, like these are the haikus, where you try to do as much as you can with as few things as I can. Recently, however, I've been getting very into obfuscation. I want people to work a little bit harder. So I've been, you know, I've always kind of hidden things within them, but now I've hidden all of it. So all of it is meant for you to really once again, you walk past it and you're like, oh, it's a little landscape. And then you're like, oh, no, it's not. Um, so I'm not going to point them out. If you haven't seen them, you're not going to. Here's another of these hidden pieces. Um, I recently traded this piece with a painter and he told me that he wanted it because it reminded him of the trucker flap girl. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I like it. <laughs> so these, you know, I'm trying to, again, hide, but reveal, um, bring a little more subtlety than, you know, this, but while retaining like, I hope you all can relate to this, but if it's not fun to do, like, why are we doing it? And like, this is fun and I want to be doing it every day. And so I do it. Uh, here are a few more of these little sneaky guys. Um, and then <laughs> I have a few photos of, I studied woodworking with Abby in Maine. And so I was like, oh, I'll put in a few pictures of my woodworking. Nope, I don't think y'all are going to see that after these initial, <laughs> after Doug and Bob, I'm like. <laughs> um, so I like, if you look at, at like, uh, like this guy, like months, little teeny, you know, I use a surgical scalpel, which isn't honestly that effective of a tool because you have to change the blades super frequently. They're they're meant to make one cut, you know, and then you're supposed to throw them away. Um, but I use a lot of I go through a lot of a lot of a lot of blades. 
I like the little teeny tiny things. And so I was doing a lot of little teeny tiny things in college, just making architectural models based on memory. And so I was milling a lot of what ended up being, these are eighth inch by 16th inch, no, 16th by quarter inch by like two foot long, you know, bits to make these houses. Uh, so this is a model of the like back stairwells that you see in Chicago. It's you know, like yay big, but just like mm, fussy stuff, like little guys. Ooh, I love it. Like, and that's really all I got. Uh, really embarrassing to go after all of these like ultra professional, really good artists. So yeah, that that like anger situation, the like mm, you're so good. Like, yeah, it's it's very potent. So thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. Okay. Next up, our final presentation for this evening is in the fine metal shop. We've got Elise Bandillo teaching intro to soldering. And to introduce, we have our fine metal assistant, Cam Netkin. Uh, Elise is an artist, jeweler, and educator joining us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, she's done it all from working on Jewelers Row doing production work, assisting in restoration work on one-of-a-kind vintage pieces, and is the founder of Night Shift Studio in Philly, a cooperative of jewelers and metalsmiths that invites collaboration and community building through shared love of metalworking. It's really exciting to have her here. Uh, we've had a really fun first day, so please join me in welcoming Elise. <laughs> That was a really nice introduction. Thank you, Cam. Um, so, all right, title slide. It's bright, it's shiny, it's been my favorite color. Um, we're going to be talking about color a lot here, but it's worth mentioning. Like Cam said, I'm teaching introduction to soldering this week. Hello. So I fell in love with metal art very early thanks to a really amazing public arts high school in South Carolina that I attended in my junior and senior year. Uh, the same school held summer workshops for freshman and sophomore age students, and 14-year-old me was very excited to play with torches. Uh, let's see here. I had a really great time playing and experimenting with my early ideas. I spent a lot of time outside growing up. You know, I grew up in South Carolina. There was a lot of woods, rivers, and uh, I was always thinking about nature. Uh, my senior concentration was a focus on full forming and raising, which came out to a lot of fun little plant sculptures. I also built some chalices and bowls, um, but those uh, photos have been lost to space and time. So I moved to Philadelphia in 2014 to study jewelry design. And you know, going from high school to college, I suddenly had to pay for my materials. So everything got a lot smaller. Um, this is also my first time experimenting with production work and fine jewelry. I'm a maker first and a designer second. You know, I think part of what I made me fall in love with jewelry is the process. And so when I'm designing and planning pieces, that can take me months. But when I get into making it, it's really a joy for me. So I tend to gravitate to making multiples. And I love this challenge of fine tuning and crafting each piece to meet specs. Um, and it's something that feeds into, again, I've done a lot of production work and it's something that, you know, some people really hate doing production. It's, you know, it is sort of monotonous, but I think anyone that likes to make jewelry and metal art loves monotony. Um, so my undergraduate program was very CAD heavy. So a lot of my old work from that time features 3D printed nylon and I do have small details that are fabricated in sterling silver. I'd make my own tubing. And you know, just do all the little parts as details. Um, I was diagnosed. Oh, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at fourteen, and some of my worst years of health were during my undergraduate. And so, a lot of my work ended up being focused on representing my experiences at that time. Uh, you know, for context, if you don't know, I mean, it's pretty common. You probably know somebody with it, but Crohn's disease is an autoimmune condition. It affects your digestive system. It's a chronic pain condition. Um, and visually illustrating my experience here was a really cathartic way for me to just work through what I was going through at that time. Um, 
by the time I finished undergrad, I felt like I'd really explored the extent of what I wanted to on this subject. And so I left school empty on ideas, but fortunately, in the midst of that, I took a color and metals class where I was introduced to enamel and jewelry. And that's really kind of changed the entire trajectory of what my career has been. Um, you know, when I graduated, I went on to work in Philadelphia's jewelry district. It's the oldest and second largest jewelers district in the country. New York's got the biggest, of course. Um, I did work doing production at a few places, um, but the most of my experience is working in fine jewelry, resizing, and repair. And it's kind of funny, the my experiences in the wholesale side of the industry really feed into how I teach, too. Um, I really like to emphasize to my students that you don't need a fancy setup to do good work. I mean, it's nice, but you know, I worked at a one job that I was applying flux with a toothpick. My soldering pick was a broken tweezer, uh, and I would be fixing these really fine, delicate old pieces. And my boss gave me the bluntest pair of pliers I think I've ever used in my life. And he was like, go figure it out. So, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's okay to just start with, with, with what you have and make your own tools and, you know, things work out. Um, repair is a lot of fun. Um, it's also maybe obvious, but repetition in practice is so key. I spent a year sizing rings eight hours a day and my soldering skills from before to after were, so, I don't know, it's really, again, like I was doing this in class today, we practice and it feeds into everything else we do. It's also my excuse to say that working repair lets you play with some really cool pieces. This is a 24 karat ring. Um, that we had to resize. I've never worked with 24 karat before. It's not something I can buy, but I can work with it. Um, I also found myself apprenticing under a master enamelist, and I've continued to do so since 2017. We do production work for various clients, but the majority of the business is centered on antique repair. It's great because I work with new pieces every week, Russian, English, and Japanese antiques, old car parts. Um, some of them are kind of silly. Uh, this is a David Webb piece. They make a lot of very outlandish animal pieces. Um, repairing things also means taking them apart to work on individual components before putting them back together. And again, I've learned a lot about clever cold connections and well-planned construction from working on these masterpieces. Um, like I stole the hinge mechanism that we use to put this piece back together for a later project. Snakes. Pansies are also a really common piece in Victorian enamel, and it's where I started experimenting working with enamel paints. Um, don't worry, I'll get to my own work soon. Uh, and here's a small Fabergé egg, and this is a 17th century French chalice. Um, so enamel has a really rich history, and it's something I like to pull inspiration from while pulling from my own experiences as well. So this is one of my most recent pieces. Um, it's an homage to the Victorian hand charms and also my love of letter writing and pen paling. And I continue to apply these skills, learn the job towards making my own fine jewelry with an emphasis on enamel work. So when I make my own work there, you can see some of those influences. A lot of mine's very deco styled and it's based on kind of the work I see every day. And then I've always loved drawing and I've found enamel as a way for me to bring that back into my metalworking practice. I, I pull a lot of my inspiration from local architecture and natural elements I encounter and personal mementos, like these earrings that I pulled from a detail from a stained glass window at the building where I work. Um, of course, part of the fun in making illustrative jewelry is the opportunity to tell a story or at least to capture a moment of one. This piece is inspired by a C.J. Hauser essay by the same name that really impacted me. Um, and then this is stepping back in time a little bit, but again, I like to capture significant personal moments in my work. So during the lockdown, when we all like couldn't do anything, I lived in the city, so I didn't. I was in the home, and I would just walk in circles around all the different neighborhoods, and everyone had their children. Like I mean, like every other house had all these drawings and paintings of rainbows that they had their children do. And it was really sweet. And so I wanted to kind of mimic that childlike drawing in a pair of earrings. Um, back to repair, one more, one more time. But jewelry is really exciting to me because there's so many little niches, especially when you work in the in the industry. 
you know, you'll find people, all they do is set diamonds or all they do is do enamel. And so even in enamel, you know, you could spend, there's artists that only do plique jour. So plique jour is a kind of miniaturized stained glass. Um, and there's a really delicate process to spending the powder um, form of the glass before you fire it into these little windows of space. Um, and this process really captured me. Uh, it's a painstaking process in a lot of ways from planning to application, even the small pieces take a really long time to complete. You're firing them maybe up to 10 times, um, but the end result's really magical. Um, and so if you notice a lot of my work, the imagery is pulled from pretty like mundane parts of my life. I'm writing letters. I This was 2020, again, lockdown. I was enameling. I had my bench in my bedroom and then my kiln in the kitchen on the other floor. So I was just going up and down for making this piece. Uh, and this, I cooked so much asparagus in 2020. Uh, so I made a little window of it. Um, so it's also say four months I spent working at another craft school. I used to take 15 minutes after lunch every day to lie in the grass and watch the bees pick over clover flowers. And it was this really beautiful meditative experience for me. It was like, the, I think most peaceful I felt in years. So I wanted to capture part of that hill for myself and made these clover patches the following year. Um, they're a mix of soldered elements, a small scale pleak and pearl rivets. And I'm still studying how to incorporate plique jour into my work. I'm currently preparing for a month long residency at the Baltimore Jewelry Center in February, and that'll be dedicated to finishing some incomplete projects and researching where I can take this specific skill. Um, and now we're here. Uh, it's my Instagram, my website, you know, Enamelies is my terrible pun brand name. Uh, and then Night Shift Studio is a communal jeweler studio in Philadelphia. We work out of the box building. We rent bench, like affordable bench space for permanent and visiting artists. Um, it's a lot of fun, but anyways, thank you. Thank you, Elise. Okay, that concludes tonight's presentations. Thank you so much to our instructors for taking the time to put your talks together and to come up here and share your work with us. It's really special. There is so much talent on campus this week. Definitely take a look if you can. Um, we do have open studio hours that we promote, you know, after um, Saturdays, Sundays, you know, after dinner. So if you ever can, if you can have the time, go take a look and see what's going on in your other studios. But otherwise, that is a wrap. I hope you enjoy your evenings and have a great workshop.